1967, a scrappy young filmmaker named George Romero had a vision. He wanted to make a horror film on the cheap, and he wanted to do it without mainstream Hollywood support. So he bought a camera and some film stock, rented a farmhouse, called in some favors, and hired a crew with low expectations, and he started work on his film, not knowing if he would even finish it. Well, he did finish it, he sold it, and the horror movie landscape would never be the same again, thanks to 1968's Night of the Living Dead. I'm Connor Izagari. I'm Caleb Jose. And this is Filmgasm. <laughs> Happy Wednesday and welcome to the Filmgasm podcast. The gauntlet to 200 episodes continues with what may be the most important film in horror movie history. Without it, I don't know if filmmakers like Wes Craven, Toby Hooper, John Carpenter would have been inspired to push the envelope in their own ways. Night of the Living Dead changed the game, showed you could make a film independently for next to nothing and without support from Hollywood or big stars, and it showed audiences that you could do whatever you wanted, provided you had the imagination. Plus, it brought zombies as we know them today into mainstream horror. This may be the most important film we talk about on this show. Yeah, and, uh, you know, after a week absence, that was involuntary, I should point out. (laughs) Um, I'm glad to be back, at least for this one. Uh, This is, uh, yeah, there's been zombie, there were obviously zombie films before Nine Living Dead um, that came out before this. Um, White Zombie, uh, literally what Rob Zombie called his prior band that whole movie involves you know um but before that they were based very much off like the hate the haitian i think it's how you say it i don't it's haitian yeah you're right haitian, hate uh the haitian culture and how they kind of viewed it and it was more voodoo inspired zombies whereas remember really brought it into what it is now like he he really laid the groundwork in i living dead for what we have what we view zombies as now like everything started with this film it's like the granddaddy uh, it's just like, you know, when people say, you know, Black Sabbath is the granddaddy of metal, you know, like that's when I let me test the granddaddy of zombie films. Yeah, I watched uh, to, to prep for this. I watched a documentary called Birth of the Living Dead, which is on available to stream on AMC Plus and uh, Tubi. And it's about just how this film came about. George Romero, a guy who made some commercials, had no filmmaking experience, wanted to do a movie. So he and, you know, his buddies all chipped in to make this thing that they were kind of unsure they were going to finish and ended up being this giant cultural phenomenon that gave birth to the modern zombie. I mean, and it comes up in the doc that, you know, zombies up to that point had been based in some kind of supernatural magic element, but he just made them exist. Like there was no, you never get a reason of why they're here of how this happened. They just show up and they never leave. And he came up with the cannibalism angle and he came up with the, you know, the only way they can be killed is by destroying the brain. All of that was him. So everything we contribute to, like the zombie, everything we think about it in pop culture can be traced back to George Romero. And that's an incredible landmark achievement for, for him. Yeah. And one could argue for better and for worse. And for better, obviously, because you have the zombie subgenre, which is a really fun subgenre. Worse in recent years because how saturated it got, more so because of the success of The Walking Dead. Um, yeah, that's more The Walking Dead's fault than it is your right <laughs> now. One thing that is kind of, and this is people that just cannot let it go, is as a lot of people know, in 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 all of Romero's dead films, you know, Night, Dawn, Day, Land, uh, Diary, and Survival. At no point does anyone utter the word zombie. I say that's for worse because while it works well, because Romero started it, Romero did it, so it's his thing, and I'm always on board when he does it. I am so sick and tired yeah. of all the other people thinking, yeah, we should do that. We should never walking dead zone for like 11 seasons. Now yeah. we were never called them zombies. I'm like, fuck you. Just call them goddamn zombies. Like we know what they are. Like we are aware of what they are. Well, that's why I loved how they did it in Shaun of the dead so much where, you know, Ed's is like any zombies out there. And Sean's just like, don't say that. Like they never really a- explain why they don't say that. It's just like, just don't say that. <laughs> like we're not using the Z word. <laughs> That was a really clever way to, d- to pay homage, but also get away with it. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's clever. But yeah, I don't know why that's become a thing. I get why he does it, but it's just obnoxious every time somebody else does it. Like, I'm glad Zombieland just went with it and said, yeah, it's fucking zombies. Yeah. 
Well, and also, like, he did it because at the end of the day, like, especially his dead films, more than probably any of his other films, like, you know, he is well known for his social commentary in these films. So it works in a way they don't use the word zombie because, yeah, they're zombies, but they're meant to be stand ins for that commentary that he's delivering. Here's the funny thing in the documentary I watched, Romero claimed to have had no intentions of making a social commentary with the first movie. With the like, first oh, one, yeah. Ben, yeah, uh, yeah. The casting, well, I'm sure we'll get into it. The casting was complete, uh, just luck of the draw. Yeah. Um, it was just, a ma- like, it just happened organically, which is so weird. That doesn't ever happen, but it happened here where the social yeah, commentary yeah. just kind of grows on the movie because of what's happening in society parallel to the film's release. And that's great. You know, I, anybody who can take anything away from a film, I don't want to take that away from them at all. No, no. But I do find it funny that Romero just was like, I'm just making a movie. Yeah, <laughs> he, no, he had no intentions of any of that happening. Yeah, and for anyone who's like, well, that's bullshit. I'm like, if you actually watch Nine Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, you can, it's no spoiler. Like, Dawn of Living Dead, yes, he's definitely just trying to make a movie. He just got really lucky with the story he was telling, how people have been able to draw from it. Obviously, with the casting of a black actor at time, which again, he even totally, he was just the best actor for the role yeah. you know all that was just luck you watch on the dead it's clear it's like night and day uh, how he's clearly <laughs> trying to make you know yeah. social content that like that's very much like him going out of his way to make social commentary. it still works i'm not i'm not taking anything away from Dawn of the dead by any means it's a fucking excellent stellar great fucking film i'm just saying like you can tell the difference when he is just making a film and he is like no i want to put social commentary on this Oh, yeah. Big time. And Dawn is going to be a fun, fun episode when we finally get to that. Yeah. Uh, and, um, this was also the the first film that starts when that uh, Romero became real known for. That's his nihilism. <laughs> Watch any fucking Romero film. This man does not like happy endings. Like, at all. <laughs> not, not one bit. Not at all. If anything, he goes out of his way to make it as bleak as fucking possible. Any, any little flame of hope you might have he's gonna walk up and just extinguish that <laughs> no nobody gets to walk away happy from this yeah it was to the point uh the i know i've mentioned before but the book that they completed that he was writing before he passed away um the living dead that was one of the things when um daniel uh kraus i believe was his name was working with uh romero's wife that they were both like we have to make sure the ending's bleak because that's what <laughs> she's like that's what george would have wanted <laughs> that's what george would have wanted so they made a, it has a bleak fucking ending, except for the goddamn zombies, of course. So it's like, yeah, it fits. <laughs> <laughs> I also read that he, um, he had two more zombie films in him uh, when he died. Uh, Road, Road of the Dead and then one untitled one. So Road of the Dead, they are his son. Last I heard is trying to finish it, but it's been dead silence. So it's kind of in the air. There's a chance it's going to be a comic book. Or it might already be a comic book, but I know that was I. That was one of the things they were trying to finish uh, in his name, and then le- the other one, yeah, and I think some of that got turned into the book. They incorporated into the book, The Living Dead. So they've been having to find ways because you know, obviously, movies, especially you know, it was getting harder for him to like fan- finance these films, unfortunately, which always seems to happen with these like older isn't that, directors. Isn't that fucking crazy though? Like the man delivered. I mean, if you just look at Night, Dawn, and Day alone. The man delivered three incredible iconic horror films that have, you know, stood the test of time and changed the landscape. It should be incredibly easy for that guy to get funding. Like, why would that? It pisses me off. Carpenter's the same way. You know, it's like these 60s, 70s directors who were so good at their craft, but never got the, the mainstream respect they deserved. I don't understand yeah. why that never happens. For some it, it's it's infuriating. And don't get me wrong, like I obviously I will always take what I can get, and they have such classics that I enjoy. But yeah, I would have loved to see them keep going. Um, and the rumor was correct. He found a way to keep going. I mean, you know, say what you were about Diary, say what you were about, about about Survival of the Dead. You know, obviously, and I know some people say what you were about Land. I personally really like Land of the Dead. I know some people kind of come out. Yeah. I like it. Land's great. Um, but at the end of the day, he got them made. Like, he got Diary made. He got survived. And that's impressive. Considering at that time, when both those films came out, that was when the zombie genre was getting saturated. Thanks to, again, The Walking Dead was getting saturated. And it was just always coming out. And yet he was still coming out with these films and putting his mark on it and his, his footprint. And the fact that he still had two more planned to do that he wanted to do 
Road of the Dead sound fucking insane. Um, the ideal for it. So like, regardless of the quality, regardless of what you think of his, you know, his later Dead films, the fact that he was still finding a way to get them made and financed and put it out there for people to see is fucking awesome that he could pull that off. Yeah, I agree. Mad respect, and I'm looking forward to talking about how this movie. Night of the Living Dead came about because it is a wild, just, you know, little movie that could story. But uh, before we do that, I do have one quick update on the rewind. This one updates episode 47 on the original Salem's Lot miniseries, and it is not good news. Gary Cooperman and James Wan's upcoming remake of Salem's Lot has been delayed to April 2023 due to what they say are substantial reshoots. And uh, that sucks. It's not really a surprise. You know, we all we heard was it's coming out and then just crickets for months. Yeah. Um, I'll say it's supposed to come out in September. It's July. We hang out in a trailer. Yeah. And I'm like, it's not. When I saw that, I'm like, yep. Wasn't losing hope there. (laughs) So I hope I'm hoping that, you know, the reshoots don't mean this movie's in, in jeopardy. It, I've been fit, look, so I've been 50 50, 50 50 on this film this whole time because, yes, Juan is producing, but Juan is producing so much shit nowadays because he's at that point where he can do that. That it's like it really doesn't mean it. It's just like, oh, cool, his name's attached, he's something he wants to do. Yeah, but the guy directing it, Animal, look, Animal Comes Home was okay, like it was an okay film, <laughs> and it's the same guy writing and directing Salem's Lot. So I'm not, I'm not super excited. And I'm, you know, I mean, look, nothing will ever beat that first, the, the crappiness, the first Annabelle, I think in that entire series. Cause I just really don't like the first movie but after creation. And then I sat through that and I was like, Oh, this should have been a lot better than it was. And with then King, with King though, it's like all, all I really want. I mean, we saw with Firestarter, we saw with Pet Cemetery. I just want somebody to follow the story. And do it, you know adapt crazy? properly. That's all I want. You know what's crazy? Did you read the story, the update they had on the movie before the delay? I did not. They were like, yeah, it's going to take place in the 70s, just like in the book. And I was like, okay, cool. And then an hour later, and also it's not coming out until 2023, April, which also delayed an error film. But this one, I'm, I'm kind of like, I can wait. It's the Last Train to Busan remake. Oh, the yeah. New York, that was supposed to come out April 23. They literally moved Salem's Lot to like the same weekend on the weekend before or some shit like that. And they're, they have now undated Last Train to New York. I think they should just cancel that shit. We don't need that. Train to Busan. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard nothing but great things. It's a very influential horror film. Very exciting. But it's foreign. So, if, you know, if it's not in English. Nobody in America fucking cares, which sucks. Well, like, straight up. Fuck you guys. Watch it dub. Jesus Christ. Like, Train to Busan, I have seen it, and it's wonderful. It's one of the best, like, modern zombie films I have seen. Yeah. And I'm not, like, boycotting it or anything. I, I really want to see it. I just haven't really had the time. But I, I do plan on watching that, and I'm looking forward to it. Oh, it's it's so good. Some of the most thrilling fucking scenes. Um, For those, for the few Eternal fans that exist, uh, one of the Eternals is in the movie before he was an Eternal. And he's a complete badass in Train to Busan. Well, I hope the remake falls apart. And uh, I hope Salem's Lot lives up to my expectations. But really, my expectations are not unmanageable. Yeah, but not very high. And as far as the the, the, yeah, the, the remake there of Busan, it's sad because the guy directing it is Timo uh, Chichanto. I like him as a director. He did uh, the, the Night Comes for Us on Netflix. Didn't see that. God, it's a kick-ass martial arts film. Guy knows how to deliver on the martial arts. Like Gore, he he's done some pretty cool stuff. He was oh, he did Safe Haven for VHS too. There you go. Okay, now I'm excited. So I like the guy doing it. The guy's a kick-ass. He came back for VHS 94. I think he did the segment with the robot thing. Yeah, yeah. First person. Yeah. yeah, he did that segment. So he's a cool director. I just. I don't want them doing fucking. I I was like, oh god, why do you get attached to this film? I just I don't know. American, I hate how American studios will take these foreign directors, they give them their big break in America, and they're like, remake this. And I'm like, why don't you just give them an original fucking movie to work with? Yeah, it's a shame. And does it ever work out? Like these remakes, most of the time they end up being shit and forgettable, and everyone still celebrates the original. That happens 
like eight out of 10 times, I would say. Almost always. Yeah. So Salem's lot, April, 2023. Uh, yeah. Here's open. So night of the living dead. Uh, a lot of this comes from that documentary I watched as well as some Wikipedia entries. So uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I did what I could. So the Wikipedia on this is actually pretty extensive. It's yeah. I wanted to make sure the information matched up. That was the big thing. Oh yeah. Night of the Living Dead, according to Romero, was inspired partly by Richard Matheson's iconic post-apocalypse novel, I Am Legend, which Romero saw as a story about widespread revolution above all else. Um, If you haven't read I Am Legend or seen the 2007 Will Smith movie or Charlton Heston's The Omega Man or Vincent Price's The Last Man on Earth, it's a story about a guy who is the only person left on Earth who's a human being, and he's surrounded by just an endless horde of vampires. And by day, he, you know, does his thing. And then by night, or by night, he avoids these monsters. And in the end, it's revealed that the monsters actually see him as the boogeyman. And they're actually pretty sophisticated and have a culture of their own. And they're afraid of him. It's a great story. Except in I Am Legend. They don't go that far yeah. into it. And then there's just actually... mindless beast versus Will Smith with a grenade. So, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I actually really enjoy I Am Legend. I'm saying it does not go down that deep. But, you know, as we've learned, Will Smith has to Will Smith. Yep, as we learn. Yeah, keep that grenade out. My wife's, but I don't even remember what he fucking said. <laughs> I've already blocked it from my memory. Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth. There it is. I will never forget that. Are you crazy? I'm trying like to the, forget it. It's like the best thing that happened to the Oscars that night. Oh my for God. For viewership, that was like their golden ticket. <laughs> Christ. Well, anyway, Romero read this and thought, you know, this is about revolution. And I guess, I mean, it, it's more about, you know, humanity and isolation, but, you know, I don't, we, people take different things away from different things. And if he hadn't thought that, he wouldn't have never, he never would have gotten this far with his movies. So he wrote a short story about, you know, Night of the Living Dead. It wasn't called Night of the Living Dead at the time. We'll get to that in a second. He assembled a production company with his friends, John Russo and Russell Striner, which they called The Latent Image. They then partnered with Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman from a local Pittsburgh-based industrial firm called Hardman Associates, Inc., and together they all formed a new production company called Image 10. They all pooled their resources to form the budget for Night of the Living Dead, which was originally called Night of the Flesh Eaters, before their distributor, Walter Reed, changed it at the last minute, leading to the film falling into the public domain, as the new title did not have a copyright notice. That's how easy it was. There was no little C with a circle. On Night of the Living Dead, the film fell into public domain. Yes. And by the way, we were talking about it offline. Uh, Schreiner and Russo did the story for the film I was talking about. O'Bannon directed it. That's why I said O'Bannon. Okay. Yeah. Return, Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So O'Bannon was involved. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, Josh and I did that episode. Of, uh, we did that on the show last year, I think. I think it was last year. Last October. Yeah, that was fun. Weird movie. Not, you know, I didn't think it was amazing, but I get it. It grew on me. At first, I remember the first time I watched it, I was like, it's okay. And then I watched it, and I was like, I, I like it more. And now I, I really enjoy it. And of course, when I enjoy it, I look up, I look to go find a Blu-ray copy and the fucking Shout Factory one is out of print. I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. <laughs> There'll be a 4K at some point, I'm sure. Oh, with all the 4Ks I keep seeing up, dude, fucking, I know you did let some get in 4K. And even I had a moment of like, I might pick that up. <laughs> really? Okay. Actually, I like, I like I know you did last summer. It's the sequels. I, oh, I like the first one. I just I can't believe that that's how easy it was for a film to just accidentally fall into a public domain. Like if I wanted to make my own Night of the Living Dead right now, I I could. Nobody could stop me. Well, I mean, he could have. Like I, I'm sure there was paperwork. I think they just forgot to do. Like you got to you got to file in and yeah. write out a form to get it trademarked and they just there was a copyright law thing instituted in 1989 to ensure something like this wouldn't happen again right and now but now what happens is if it goes on for so long eventually you can lose the copyright unless you do like you renew it or something like that you know what's about we're getting a winnie the pooh horror film now because you know what i start to renew it i found out that uh mickey mouse is about to fall into the public domain yeah i'm surprised disney's even allowing that I, well, there's, there, it's weird. Like the original, I think it's like you can make a Mickey Mouse thing as long as you don't invoke 
any thoughts of Disney, which is absolutely impossible. So it's like, it's basically Disney going fuck around and find out. Like, you just try it. I'm just saying, like, Disney is so, like, we don't lose a dime at this company that they're not like, hey, we should probably renew this so we continue getting money off this mouse. I imagine they're like, you know, we got Star Wars and Marvel. Is anybody really lining up for the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse anymore? Just let it ride. Let it go. <laughs> we got better you, stuff. You think, like, the Wayne the Pooh thing where we immediately get, like, a Mickey Mouse horror film? I would love that. <laughs> I mean, nobody's thinking of Disney. That's for sure. Oh, boy. I wouldn't want to have to fight that in court. <laughs> I mean, they sued a daycare center. They'll they'll take anyone down. There was that guy that secretly filmed a horror film at like uh, Disneyland. Yeah, and Escape from Tomorrow. Got, yeah, he almost got sued, but I think he escaped it somehow. I know. that's that, That's been on my list for the show for a long time. I want to watch that because I got to know, like, what did he do? How do you go- shoot a gorilla-style horror movie at Disney World? <laughs> I'm seeing it. I've been wanting to just because I'm like, that's you got my interest with that concept. Yes, very much. Uh, so that's yeah. So Night of the Flesh Eaters became Night of the Living Dead. Romero never saw any profits from Night of the Living Dead. And when he decided to continue this franchise, he couldn't use the phrase living dead because that now belonged to Walter Reed. So Dawn of the Dead is what and Dawn of the Living Dead doesn't, doesn't quite roll off the tongue. As say, on, honestly, yeah, Dawn of the Living Dead, Day of the Living Dead, Land of the Living Dead. But then so even in, in the opposite way, Night of the Dead doesn't sound right either. No. <laughs> so it works so kind out. Of, it worked out really well. Because, I mean, if you think about it like this, you could be like, oh, God, all the money you could get from this movie still. Because obviously he lost a shit ton of money by not getting copyrighted. Everyone lost a shit ton of money by not getting copyrighted. Yeah. But... We won't have the dead films that we have because of it, you know, with George Jeremy. We would not have the very, you know, return, return of the living dead. I would be like, in a weird way, like we got the best of both worlds. We got like a great, two different great continuations in their own way. That's true. That's true. It's almost like it happened for a reason. It's interesting watching Romero talk about this in the documentary because he's, he's smiling, but there's a lot of anger behind those eyes. <laughs> he's just like, yep. Made a mistake there. <laughs> He's very much clearly still bitter about this. But I could not be making, letting it come out. I could be making. I could be making so much more off those visuals. <laughs> oh, God, I can't imagine fucking up like that. And I mean, it wasn't his fuck up. They changed the title. Yeah, that's what messed it up because they had followed it under the original title, which was Night of the Anubis or some something like that. Yeah, there was, it was Night of Anubis, and then it was Night of the Flesh Eaters, and then it was Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, but the moment they changed it to Flesh Eaters is when it was like, oh, well, that that went out the window. They never brought to do it again, and they stuck with Living Dead, and yeah. And Romero was a novice in this. You know, he didn't know how you know copyright law worked. He didn't know what to file, so it just never came to him, and, you know, he got fucked over. Yeah, which, speaking of which, the, I, need a, um, I, I didn't have time to watch it, but apparently the Criterion has the work print of Night of Anubis as one of its features so i don't know how different that is yeah we'll have to check that out cool so george romero remains one of the most iconic horror filmmakers of all time thanks to his highly influential zombie franchise that began with night of the living dead ended in 2009 with survival of the dead some of his additional films include monkey shines night riders the crazies the amusement park the dark half and creep show Romero sadly passed away in 2017 at 77 years old due to lung cancer. And uh, that was a bummer, but dude smoked like a chimney. It was not really a surprise. No. Have you seen the amusement park? It's on Shutter. I haven't. I've um, outside of the dead movies. I've really, I've seen the dark half and I've seen creep show. I've seen creep show. Obviously I've seen the remake of the crazies, which I mean, look, come at me all you want. I really enjoy. Um, but do Dude, the amusement park. I watched it when it got put on Shutter because it was like it was a PSA film we made that they never released because I guess it was too intense. And it, if you want like a horrific look at aging in America, my God, you can. Because this was before I like this was before he really it was like you know became George A. Romero, and it yeah it is a it's a nihilistic as fuck look on aging and being old in america it's not it's not pretty and mind you this was a guy like when you made this he was in college in his 20s (laughs) (laughs) 
that's awesome. I'm glad that they were able to restore it and uh, we, we got to see it. I know um, Josh reviewed it on the site a while back and he, he adored it. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, a lot of this stuff is happening, thankfully, to his wife. Thank God for his wife and kids. They are big about they are working with the the Pittsburgh uh, Film Library or some museum over in Pittsburgh. That's like because he's a darling, obviously, in Pennsylvania because of, you know, what he did, and especially on the indie circuit that can't be spoken about enough. Like in a way, he the indie spirit he brought into that area. Thanks to Not Let Me Dead, Dawn and Day and all his other films. Yeah, um, but she's been working with an institution there on like re you know um remastering a lot of stuff getting it out there in the public and that was one of the things they worked on was getting the amusement park you know cleaned up remastered and put out there for people to see that's great I, that's one thing i always wonder about when these big guys you know these big storytellers pass it's like what were they sitting on you know what what unpublished work did they still have what was finished you know, what was half finished and it's always great to see, you know, more content come out, even if it is, you know, not as complete as they would have would have preferred. It's nice yeah. to just have more. Exactly. It's kind of like the, the book I've, I mentioned, The Living Dead. You know, he didn't complete it. You know, he died before he could do that. But they went out of the way to, again, you know, author talk to his wife and like really worked on making sure that, OK, we're going to finish it, but it's going to make, be his voice, not mine. And they worked really hard to maintain his voice throughout. And it feels like his book. Like, it reads a lot like if he had written the whole thing. So it, it's wonderful, even though he may have passed and not finished it, just to have that and be able to read it and have that go on. You know, it's cool. Oh, for sure. I'm a big fan of his uh, his longtime friendship with Stephen King and what has come out of that. You know, Creepshow is one of my favorite horror films. I love that movie. <laughs> Oh, and, dude, creep, creep show's great. The show on Shutter is great. Um, I, I, uh, I would say when Josh listens to this, but I don't know when he's gonna be able to listen to this. Um, I finally went to the comic shop for us and put on our pool list. Uh, the upcoming continuation. They're bringing back the Creep Show comic to tell new stories, and it, yeah, it's coming back. And I put us on there to make sure we could get it. So, great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, I thought. Romero did pretty decent justice to King's book, The Dark Half. The movie was, you know, wasn't amazing, but it was I mean, pretty on par. I will say, admittedly, the book is one of my favorite King books. Like, it's not a bad book by any means, but it's not my favorite King book. Well, we were talking, and before we started recording, we were talking about the power of spite. And King wrote The Dark Half entirely out of spite because he got outed as Richard Bachman, and he wrote this as a way to be like, well, fuck you. So it wasn't exactly, it didn't come from a place of love it came from a place of spite so i get why it's not really his best work <laughs> i liked it though i had a i read that book in about three days i was like this is pretty good but uh i get why people don't really dig it so i don't uh, hate it it's very hard for me to hate a stephen king but grant i have not read the the tome that is insomnia i've heard a lot of people say that that's not a good book and yeah my uncle, a lifelong uh, King fan, made it halfway through Insomnia and then stopped reading his work for about 20 years. Oh my God. <laughs> he was just done. I haven't really, like, typically if I don't like a book, I'm not going to power through. So I haven't, like, what I've read of King that I didn't like, I just stopped reading. Like, uh, the Tommy Knockers, I didn't really care for, and the Talisman, I didn't really like that either. So I just... What? Stopped. I love the Talisman. It was more... I, I didn't like Str uh, Straub's style I, I felt like it was dominating and i just i didn't care for it oh i love the talisman i didn't care too much for its sequel black house yeah, that was okay but i i power through i i'm like well i'm gonna finish this not for every book like if i i mainly if it's an author i'm not familiar with yeah i'll fucking i'll be like that this is not hitting me and i'll stop but the king book yeah i'll power through <laughs> i don't typically i'm like usually if, if it's going to be a bad part it's going to be the ending so i'm probably safe for most of the book <laughs> Man, I'm really, I'm glad I didn't say anything about the fact that they're developing the talisman for Netflix finally, because I was really excited to hear that news. So yeah. I really like that book. Like, I really like the talisman. I couldn't, I couldn't get into it. I was like, I got a third through it and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And I just, I, there were stuff I'd rather read. So I gave up. God damn. I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I thought for sure that. Sorry. Be really... Sorry. Damn it. I really like that book. <laughs> I'm not taking anything away from you. You can still love that book. You did. The enjoyment has faded from me. God damn it. 
Um, let's talk about the cast of this thing. We got Dwayne Jones as Ben, one of the first non-exploitative black leads in a horror movie. That was a huge deal. Uh, he's not, it's, his race is never an issue in the movie. There's no, it came up in the doc a lot. There's never a moment where it's like, you know, you, you know, you people aren't all bad or some shit like that. Like that never comes up. He's just yeah, another yeah. survivor. It never comes up. Even the the, the very volatile uh, Mr. Cooper, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, at no point throws out the inward, even though he gave off serious high throat inward vibes. It's funny because the two of them in real life became lifelong friends. So I've, I said the character, not the actor. I'm I know it just it just makes me to... laugh when it's like you know he's he's such an asshole on screen and then off screen it's like hey my buddy. Always makes me yeah. So okay, yeah. His character gave off the vibes that he would say that word at some point. Yeah. And no, yeah, it's never brought up. Um, and again, it's funny because so many people have you know. And again, there's nothing wrong with like trying what you want from a film. That's the beauty of subjective art form. Yeah. Um, but with that said, I think it's awesome that like Romero, who again, it's kind. Of, I'm one of those. It's kind of like uh, I always say, like when Tron Pill before us came out. And so, like, hey, get out to horror film. I'm sorry, but shut the fuck up. You can't argue when the director slash writer told you what the movie is. You know what I mean? And George Romero has come out numerous times, you know, prior to his death to be like, that he was just a good actor for the part. Like, there was no social commentary. We, we tested a lot of people, and he was the best. Um, and, he, and to his credit, he embraced it. He was like, yeah, it, you know, like, it was a lucky coincidence. Um, so I, I like that. That wasn't intentional, but, like, it did end up, becoming this uh, an identity of the film that works out in its favor very well yeah talk about a hell of a coincidence am i right like damn but um i remember reading that the character was originally this like hard talking kind of semi-intelligent truck driver and when dwayne jones came on he was a classically trained actor he helped refine the character into more of an academic intelligent guy and uh that's cool he also like well <laughs> There's a big chunk in the documentary about how, you know, impactful him slapping a white woman and shooting a white man was to 1968 audiences. Like, that makes sense. I mean, think about it. In 1960 alone, fucking psycho flushing a toilet was like, oh, no, we're getting frisky in this movie, guys. <laughs> Frankly, I think the MPA, if you think of a flushing toilet makes you feel frisky, you've got much worse problems than that dude. I go does. I <laughs> the things I read about in like old films that were like fucking, you know, transgressive. And I'm like, really that? Like, but it's like, again, you know, different time, right? Again, it's, you know, the one thing people can't do when they get so offended by something is different time. It was a different place. Um, and yeah, I, I get that. I, I understand that 100% why they would focus on that. Cause yeah, you know, for 1968, I mean, yeah, the civil rights and stuff has happened, of course. And obviously the North has always been more historically nicer than the south has when it comes to racism not saying the north is doesn't have its bad bigotry you know bigoted people there i'm saying they have been historically nicer um but uh yeah i would see in 1968 again still you know a black man slapping a woman and shooting a bunch of you know white again there were zombies at that point but you know white dudes i can see what that's like holy shit this movie's really pushing some boundaries, am I right? Yeah, <laughs> this got banned by a lot of people for, you know, that, but also for, like, George Romero was called, a, you know, a, a Satanist by the church for, like, you know, the dead are rising in your movie, and you're just, you, you're you going to show that in your satanic ways, and it's like, ah. Uh, the, the, the cannibalism for 1968, I'm actually really surprised by how graphic it is in this movie. Well, it's real organs. Then a butcher was one of the investors, and he donated a bunch of pig pieces, and they just had the extras go to town. Like they're really eating dead flesh. That part to this day I did not know until today. I thought it was just fake. As, re as real entrails. That's real livers and bones they, and shit. These really... guys got into it. They didn't cook that shit. They're not having ribs. Like this is a this is dead flesh that these extras got really into the mindset of a zombie and just ate. No. No cooked bacon on that set. Nope, but a lot of raw intestines. God. <laughs> Can you imagine as soon as this cut, you're just vomiting off to the side? <laughs> All right, I'm good for take two now. God. I don't think there were a lot of take twos. 
they didn't have the money for that. It was basically like you either get it or it's not in the movie. <laughs> Holy hell, man. Um, Dwayne Jones would also star in another cult horror classic, Ganja and Hess, uh, but not much else. He died in 1988 at 51 years old due to cardiopulmonary arrest. And uh, here's a neat little fun fact connecting Night of the Living Dead to The Walking Dead. Uh, the character of Morgan Jones, who we meet in the first episode, the guy who takes in Rick later on, loses his fucking mind, then doesn't. His son, Dwayne, named after this guy, Dwayne Jones. I never clicked on that. You know what? I will say quick side note, that episode when they when we see him again for the first time and he has that whole like Nassau Red Rick. That's actually one of like the best fucking moments in that show. Like that is a fucking that actor is great. And that was a hell of a speech he gave. Even I thought I was like, ooh, damn, acting. Here we go. Lenny James. And he's he's English, which makes that even better. <laughs> yeah. No, I still I still remember that scene when Rick's like, what happened to you? You know, Andrew Lincoln's fucking southern accent. <laughs> what happened to you, Carl? I mean, <laughs> Morgan. <laughs> I, <laughs> yes. bring, bringing Morgan back into the show, though, I know this has nothing to do with with the episode, but it's just it's just it's something that's been noodle like needling up here. Bringing Morgan back into the show and having him gradually find his way back to Alexandria was the most coincidental bullshit I've ever seen in pop culture history. How yeah, how they utilize him after that episode, I was just like, okay, but that episode when he has that speech, fantastic, powerful yes, acting, yes. great speech. And they were like, you want more of him? And I was like, not really. I had enough in that fucking moment. And they were like, no, we're going to do this really boring middling fucking arc where he doesn't kill a zombie now because he's a pacifist and he has a stick. And I'm like, fuck you. Well, it was more that like he found the map that Abraham had given Rick that said, you know, Rick Grimes. And he's like, I remember that guy. And he followed them from Georgia to D.C., are you kidding me? <laughs> it, yeah, it was really like after that, I was like, okay, you guys could have just left it on that really inspiring speech. Yeah, so I, remember, like, I saw Red Rick and I, I had to kill him. <laughs> yeah, well, we got that cool flashback episode with John Carroll Lynch, too. That was that was that was neat. Oh, I remember yeah. when I used to really like that show. Those were the days. The show had, the show had like, especially its early season, had so many great moments. Like, what is it? Like, one of my favorite is when Rick has to go find Herschel in season two. Mm. And he goes to that bar and those fucking guys come in and he just takes them out. And then the, the clutch song fucking plays. Yeah. The, like, God the guys, damn, yeah. The guy's looking for Nebraska, right? Or they were from yeah. Nebraska. They're from Nebraska or something like that. And Rick knows something's up and he's just fucking without hesitation, whips that gun and fucking shoots them in the fucking eye. For me, it was when they when they were acquiring the prison from those three prisoner guys, and there was that one guy who was clearly going to be a problem, and Rick just fuck machete in the fucking head. Dude, like, the stare, the stare down he gave him. I remember that 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 fucking classic Andrew Lincoln crazy stare he does throughout the show. This uh, and then just fucking hits him, and oh god. Dude, yeah, like that show, you know, and it's it has its moments, but yeah, I still like uh when Rick like gets to Alexandria for the first time and like loses his shit. It's like waving the gun in the street. He's like, I told y'all. It's like, I I love when he uh, when they did get to Alexandria and he got to you know shave and shower for the first time, and even losing the beard and everything, and he looked like season one Rick. He still didn't quite look like he used to look like the weight of everything is still on his face dude look i yeah dude i stand by this look i'll stand by this statement and i have the same issues with the emmys that i have with the oscars they fucking love to snub genre unless it's american horror story which i think ryan murphy paid someone he had to pay someone um well he also was like you know he made glee so he already had some clout with the emmys yeah, um, but they ignored genre and dude, Andrew Lincoln, to all joking aside, absolutely crushed it during his run on that show. Like, absolutely crushed every fucking moment that was given to him. My my cousin Ryan is like the biggest Walking Dead fan I've ever met, and he uh, he loved when Negan showed up. And he would constantly throw Negan quotes at me. Like whenever he would help me out with something, he would just go like, you see service. And like, just shit like that all the time. Always made me laugh. 
I like Negan when he first came on. I don't necessarily like the damn arc they sent him on. Excuse the shit out of my goddamn French, but did you just threaten me? Like, Jeffrey I missed that Morgan. guy. What happened to that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeffrey Dean Morgan was such a good goddamn choice. I remember when they announced him, I was like, oh, I think you told someone, someone yeah, told me. I, I was at a freaking out. I, I told, I was at a pizza place. And the text, like, I was looking at IMDb and it said Jeffrey Dean Morgan cast as Negan. And I was like, what? And I told you and you were like, ah, and that yeah, was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And he, oh my God, he crushed it. <laughs> oh, good times. Good times. It's been a minute since I keep, I keep dipping toes back into the walking dead and then just walking out of the pool because the water's too, too warm. It's gone on too long. It's a show that's gone way too long. Like, Almost all the original cast gone, except Maggie, and they are hinging hard on her being the main character because Daryl, as much as I love that character, like he, let's just be honest, he's a thinly written character. I'm going to say it right now. Like he's a cool character, but he does, he's not the most deep, complex character on the show. Well, Maggie and Negan are getting their own like buddy cop show now, right? Yeah, when The Walking Dead ends on these last eight episodes. What a great way to know they're going to make it out alive. Yeah, right? Dude, they've been doing that on this last season. Like, do you want this spinoff with this character? And I'm like, wait till the season's over. Stop telling me he's clearly going to live. Like, uh, the Daryl Carroll spinoff? I'm like, oh, well, they're not dead. Well, Carol now might be in Jeopardy. There's some beef. It's not her spinoff anymore. Mm. Um, Daryl and Dog. <laughs> That's going to be the um, show. <laughs> I just have Dog and Bounty Hunter music playing in my head. Oh, my God. Dog the Bounty Hunter and The Walking Dead. <laughs> Be yeah, so get that zombie. <laughs> He'd be killed so fast. You think he, how many zombies he killed? He'd still be going on his bounties. He doesn't even realize anything's changed. He's he's just capturing people. He just thinks people have gotten a lot ruder lately. Yeah. He's still praying to Jesus telling these people. <laughs> Go with Christ. God damn it. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's no way we're gonna get through this episode without somehow talking a bit about. The Walking Dead. It's just and, and zombie media, Jeremy. This movie, again, it's, you know, we said it already, but without this film, you'd not have the zombie media that we have now. This oh. film was huge in getting that yeah. to what we got now. We'd still be dealing with like Haitian voodoo zombies and all that shit. Like that would still be the mainstream when it comes to zombies. I wonder if if Night of the Living Dead hadn't happened, I wonder what movie would have kind of taken its place as like the game changer. Zombie. But that movie doesn't happen without without Dawn of the Dead, though. I don't care. <laughs> Zombie fighting a shark, god damn it. I don't know. That is a good question. Would it have been zombies that became like the big thing, or would like werewolves have had a resurgence or something? I uh, I don't know. I, uh, that's that's tough. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to like kind of backtrack decades of pop culture to try to find like a a moment and that's just not easy yeah because i mean if you really think about it, like after this like yeah we had zombie movies here and there between what romero's doing obviously you know i mentioned it already zombie with um with those got with the italians but i mean as far as like the boom that we have you know obviously we had you know the fuck everyone who gets all picky about but you know you're 28 days later and um you know you're Sean the deads but it wasn't really until Walking Dead came out or AMC that all of a sudden we got just like a fucking increase yeah. left and right. But it wasn't so much about like just the zombies that Night of the Living Dead was so influential with. It was the fact that it was an independent film made for next to nothing that was super violent, but also very successful. And that's what inspired so many filmmakers to try to make something of their own. So without that movie, I think we lose hundreds of careers, which is yeah, cause that, that's the, yeah, because that's the thing that doesn't get talked about as much, really. And we haven't really, had, I mean, in our friends, we haven't really talked about as much. Um, but what you know, obviously, what this film did for the zombie so the zombie so genre is, you know, without question, the evidence is there. But what this also did for independent filmmaking, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, people forget that for the longest time there was no real thing as independent filmmaking. Like you made films for the studios, and that was it. That yeah. was. If your oh, film you didn't have Hollywood backing or a big star, you didn't have a film. You weren't allowed to make a movie. That was those were the rules. Yeah. So the fact that people like Herschel Gordon Lewis, people like George A. Romero were coming out saying no, uh Corman 
Um, brought, you know, I did not let that one. Almost let that. Almost forgot that one. I apologize. But uh, you know, Roger Corman, people like that that were starting to come out and say, like, no, you can do this on a much smaller. You don't have to deal with the studios. You can do this more budgeted. And the things they and Romero didn't necessarily do it. Obviously, we're not living that. But you know, like especially Corman getting aging actors put into these films and them having a, you know a second leg in their career when people thought oh well at this age they're done we don't want to watch them anymore well no we can see them in this really cool low budget horror film and have a good time um so yeah what he did you know obviously you know corman came you know before him and L- horse and lewis came before him but you could argue that like I, well, okay i'm not gonna say corman left a fucking huge ass imprint um, that's definitely felt in people like Formula uh, Productions and Trauma, especially. Um, but what Romero did just for independent cinema in general across the board really has left probably the, one of the biggest imprints because that was something that you can tell just affected movie making across the entire spectrum of like how you can do independent cinema. In the doc, there's this great moment that kind of it shows the influence of Romero's Night of the Living Dead on the ver- various films that come after films like Straw Dogs and The French Connection and Chinatown and like these gritty, you know, more mainstream violent movies that had a chance now because things had changed. And that's that's amazing. I, I love that. Um, I also found out that prior to Night of the Living Dead, horror films were mostly marketed towards children. Yeah, because, I mean, it wasn't really an MPAA, or now yeah. it's an MPAA. They dropped the Of America because of Famers. Um, but it was, you know, it was Vincent Price so, doing, like, you know, Haunted House, and there might be, like, a creepy werewolf or something, but you yeah. dropped your kids off at the movies to watch some horror films while you, you know, went and got some Quaaludes and partied a little bit. And, yeah, you're... I mean, yeah, it was stuff like William Castle's, you know, House on Haunted Hill and 13 Ghosts and all the shit they got remade in the early 2000s. It's you very not Ken Frilling stuff. But isn't that um, hilarious that like at, there was a time where like the horror film was basically like just like Sesame Street? Yeah, it was like a sideshow attraction. You went to go have a good time and get scared and spooked. Yeah. And then I was uh, Roger Ebert went and saw a Night of the Living Dead. And, you know, no, there were kids in there sobbing because they were terrified. And Ebert basically was like, won't somebody think of the children? And then 10 years oh. later, he jumped on the bandwagon of like, I was wrong. It's a classic. So it's like, come on, buddy. Fuck you, Ebert, you piece of <laughs> shit. I do love that he's just like, I'm just, I wasn't even watching the movie. I was watching all these children absolutely terrified and sobbing into their shirts. And I just was thinking, why? And I'm well, just like, <laughs> well and other than that, cocksucker, um, other than him aside, that, that was the rest of the other thing people forget is that for a long time, films were double features because it wasn't like it is now. There's something coming out every weekend where it's in the theater or in your home. It was an event to go see a movie like it. They had one fucking film world and it traveled America and played at some place for like a week and then went to another place for another week. That's how this happened. So a lot of times they double featured it. So you got the bang for your buck. Um, and it really was a buck. Not- Those are the days. Yeah. And uh, God. And that's what would happen is that this film would get with something that was meant for the whole family, but that movie would play first. And then Night of the Living Dead would play. Um, and at the time, yeah, they didn't know. Parents didn't know. And they were like, oh, my God, this is horrifying. They shouldn't be watching this. Um, and then eventually it caught on. But at that point, the film was become so successful that they were like, well, fuck it. People are watching it. Yep. <laughs> don't, don't take your kids to the second show. <laughs> Jesus, can you imagine, like, Going back in time and showing like audiences in '68 a movie like *The Sadness*. God, I feel like the the very fabric of American society would just crumble. I would love to go back in time and show people a Serbian film and see how that fucks up America. They <laughs> wouldn't like. I don't feel like we'd be able to progress as a society. Everyone would be like, "We got to destroy whatever that was." I come back to the future. America's a lawless wasteland. It's like, oh shit, that was not a movie I should have shown. It people. starts a war with Taiwan. <laughs> like just, oh shit. <laughs> well, this is a bad idea. <laughs> God damn. Uh, oh yeah, we were talking about the cast. <laughs> uh, Judith O'Day played Barbara, the hapless survivor. 
she's only appeared in a handful of films, none of which are noteworthy. Uh, and yeah, her character is kind of uh, kind of sucks. Not gonna lie, Barbara. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Uh, when I was watching on Joe Bob, he was defending her. She's he's like she saw her brother get attacked. She doesn't know what's going on. She's in shock. I'm like, you're right. And you're right. I'm not actually on, like, you're absolutely right, Joe. Like, yeah, she's in shock. And I totally get it. But unfortunately, this is one of those cases where, and again, I doubt, like, everything else, I doubt it was Troy Romero's intention. It unfortunately is one of the more negative aspects of its time. <laughs> I looked into it. Uh, Barbara was supposed to be a lot more of a vibrant, talkative character, but uh, the actress in Romero worked out that she'd probably be in shock. So they just had her be in shock. <laughs> pretty much the whole right movie. which is what joe, that's why joe about brought it up because that's yeah which again obviously as you saw there wasn't meant to come off that way but unfortunately it being a 1968 film and her, the female character being in shock and not talking and now we have this new main character it is something where you're like ah oh, shit like you can get people's argument that aren't as educated right where they're like well they're just making her second place and i'm like it wasn't their intention, but I mean, if you're not doing research, I get what you know what you're saying at face value. Absolutely, I know the Tom Savini when he remade it in nineteen in the nineteen nineties. Um, he him and Romero worked it out to make her active, so they went back to actually making her more active. That's something that they wanted to fix. I think even Romero was like years later was kind of like not the best idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's one one small step for black actors, two steps backward for for women <laughs> it's sorry again i get it and you're right you i you would probably be in shock like if this was your first thing seeing and some dude just attacks your brother and kills him and then is trying to like eat you i i would be in shock i'd be like i don't know what the fuck i just saw like but unfortunately just because of the time the, the it being 1960s america it it unfortunately reflects the negative aspect by accident you know of the time period yeah carl hardman played harry cooper he was one of the film's producers and makeup artists who wore many hats as did a lot of the film crew his only other credit as an actor is a 1996 movie called santa claus as in c-l-a-w-s so fuck yeah santa claus i'm adding that to my rotation i will watch that movie no, <laughs> I will. It's, it's night of the living dead and then in 1996 santa claus but that's that's it unreal uh, he That's died in 2007 at 80 years old from pancreatic cancer, but he, he does a great job as Harry Cooper. Yeah. You know, like, look, he's, you know, it's funny. It's, it's someone pointed out at uh, Joe Bob was one of the point out, he goes, no, you may hate him, but he's very logical in what he achieves. And like, and he, Joe Bob pointed out, he goes, technically had they stayed in the basement, Cooper was kind of right. They sure stayed in the basement. Like they won't have been heard there. They probably could have, you know, held out all night and been just fine, minus, you know, obviously the zombie daughter. Um, but, um, yeah, it's funny. Because I remember when I was a kid, I fucking hated this guy. So I was like, God, this guy's an asshole. And I've gotten older. I've been like, you know, he's an asshole, but, like, he's making some logical – he's asking logical questions here. Like, he's I mean, not wrong. Logically, I would have just left when there were, like, three outside. I would have been like, I'm not going to get trapped in this farmhouse. I'm going to – I'm going to go. I'm going to leave. <laughs> You know what I think? I thought about it. I was like, what if you just like destroy the stairs somehow or just block the stairs? And then you have the upstairs. So then if they do get in, it's not that high. You can fucking get the hell out still. That was a way better idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is the original zombie asshole. Every zombie property ever made, every video game, comic book, movie, TV show, there's always a prick in the group who makes things difficult for everybody. And yeah. they can all be traced back to Harry Cooper. Yeah. Oh. God. He's the original yeah. Merle Dixon. Merle Dixon or Kenny for you Walking Dead uh, Telltale video game series oh, fans. fucking Kenny. I remember that son of a bitch. Dude, I played all four seasons. I don't know if you did. Did you, did you play I all played four? The first, I played the first two. I'm trying to get oh, the okay. complete set so I can play it all through again. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, perfect. Because he's in the first two. He, and yeah, oh, dude, when he came back, though, and like, because I was so invested in season one, there's so many hard decisions that I had to make. I'm like, oh, God damn it. And then like, when it got to that point, we have to decide what to do with Kenny. I was like, oh, no, don't make me make this. No, I can't make this decision right now. No, it's Kenny. 
I've played I've played the first one twice and I always try to be an asshole, but I, I don't I can't do it. It feels too real. It's like I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. It's so I weird. know. I, I get so invested. I'm like, oh God. I thought about doing it. I was like, I can do this again, be an asshole. And I tried, and I was like, I get too invested. Yeah. I'm making these choices. I can't do it. It's not right. It doesn't feel right. Like I wouldn't make this decision. <laughs> Those games are brilliant for kind of forcing your emotions like that. Oh yeah, that's fucking great. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, it's just become part of zombie culture. There's always got to be some asshole in the group. Nothing can always go swimmingly. It's always got to be the guy who fucks everything up. Yeah. And again, like I said, like if you listen to like he's one of those guys that like unlike some assholes in zombie culture, they're just assholes. Harry Cooper is making sense, but his execution is terrible. It's the worst execution. Well, he's also, you know, he's got his daughter to worry about. So he's not thinking logically. He's thinking frantically. So he's not. He's just trying to make, you know, impulse rash decisions that hopefully will work out in the long run. And they don't. Nope. Uh, Not one bit. Marilyn Eastman, another producer, played Helen Cooper. She was also in an episode of Perry Mason and that movie Santa Claus with Carl Hardman. Uh, She died last year at 87 years old. And uh, I remember talking about that on one of our shows. And um, she was also a makeup artist. Uh, she's the zombie who eats the bug off the tree. <laughs> and I, okay. judging by everything I've learned about this movie, I'm going to bet hard cash that was not a fake bug. <laughs> that felt like a moment where she saw a bug, she was in character, and she went for it. What, what motivation would my zombie have right now <laughs> to eat this bug? You, you're painted up like a zombie. Romero's telling you, act like a zombie. You're a zombie. I can understand kind of getting into getting into it a little bit. And I don't know if I'd eat a bug, but I, I would not eat a bug. That's that's <laughs> insanity. I also love how Romero talked about how he directed the zombies. He didn't tell any of them this is how a zombie walks. He told them walk like a zombie. So everyone's walking a little different. Everyone's doing their own kind of zombie. And he did that throughout all the films. And I thought that was really cool. It's a very smart way to show that they're all still maintaining some form of individuality. Yeah. And that's, and again, that's, and that's the one thing where you can tell if it's a Romero zombie or not. Cause I mainly, as much as I love, I know I talked about Sean on the dead um, and Sean dead did do it wonderfully and obviously doing the homework. Um, but, you know, like with the walking dead again, right. They're just zombies. They're just mindless shambling around zombies um, whereas Romero introduced the idea, well, even in this, and I always forget it until I was watching it recently. Um, but even not living the, the idea that like they still have a semblance of their humanity in there somewhere. It's deep. It's very down behind the urge to eat brains, but there's a semblance of humanity in there. They still do stuff like the fact that you know Johnny comes back for Barbara, right? They're coming to get you, Barbara, and he, sure enough, he comes back. It's like there's some kind of humanity still in there to make them what they used to be. Well, for me, the best evidence was that like they're using tools, like they're using, they're picking things up and using them to smash doors down and stuff like that. That's, that's primal, but that's still instinct. Yeah. And that's cool. I love that his, and I love that throughout the films, they get smarter, you know, from, from night to dawn to day to land, they're getting really smarter. And that's just, that's really cool to me. You just say really smarter. Getting so much for sure. Smarter. (laughs) I talk good. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I got it. I got overexcited. But yeah, it's uh it's really cool. Yeah. Um, and something again he explores in the book The Living Dead, and you actually get to read it, and he does points where it takes place from a zombie perspective. So you're yeah, and it's interesting how he does that because at first it's literally just scribbling on the page of like must get brains, eat so hungry, brains, brains, brains. And as it progresses, it's I don't know why I'm doing this, but something about it makes me happy. Like you, you can see that the humanity is slowly coming back and almost, you know, again, Romero being Romero, right? This book has a very nihilistic ending for the humans, of course, but for the zombies, it's that little nugget of like, maybe they can go fully back one day. It's going to take years, but maybe the zombieism is a reset um, mm-hmm. for humanity. And it, it's just an interesting idea that kind of like briefly he flirt, he looks like he's kind of flirting with in the Living Dead. And I'm sure he's kind of flirting with with um, his films as well. It's funny he's asked in the mo- like in the doc like you know 
why is this all happening? And his only explanation he gives is uh, God changed the rules. I was like, that's fucking creepy. I like that. Yeah. I do. There's no more room in hell. God changed the rules. I do like in this movie, they talk briefly about some kind of comment that passes Earth that they think is why. And I like when they cut to like the news people, they're like, we talked to scientists and they're like, yeah, we don't. They're essentially like very professional, but they're basically like, we don't fucking know why this is happening. Like, we don't, we don't know. We don't, we don't, we're trying to figure it out. We don't know what's going on. I like how this movie just kind of shows that you can't count an authority in times of great strife like this. You know, the scientists don't know what's going on. The army is not going to save you. The cops aren't going to save you. You got to pretty like all, all you can count on is yourself. So there's, you know, there's more social commentary for you. This was in the middle of Vietnam. <laughs> so people were going to, you know, connect that shit. Man, it's like you just guys just did a movie on Vietnam too. I know, right? Weird. <laughs> Um, or as hell or as hell check out the platoon episode of oscar sunday um keith wayne played tom this is the only thing he was ever in he died in 1995 50 years old and yeah he's kind of the like you know leave it to beaver grown up last bit of the 50s who gets blown up (laughs) he really is he has such such a like all right let's do it howdy ho gee whiz look at all those ghouls out there we should do something about that she was, man, I tell you what, God. we sh- we should get out there and take care, protect the women, am I right? A Pennsylvania accent. What's going on here? <laughs> like just yeah, just a complete goof. Like a, yeah. like a beta male and yeah, he gets blown up. Cuz his girlfriend's he, sweater gets caught on the I would left her and be like, "Well, later babe." <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, Judith Ridley played Judy. She was also in Romero's film, There's Always Vanilla. She's the other girl who gets she gets blown up, too. And uh, she was one of the producers, uh, like, secretaries. And they were like, hey, you want to be in the movie? And she's like, sure. Like, it was literally just throwing out, you know, who wants to be in this movie that we might not finish? Anything to fill out this cast they desperately needed. <laughs> yeah, considering how, like, I'm sure there wasn't a lot of, you know, people weren't really getting paid that much. There was a this wasn't, you know, some big break for a lot of people. When you consider that, and then you think about how hard these zombies went for it, like, that's some fucking commitment. Like, Romero must have been, like, amazing at giving a pep talk. Probably. something. Look, man, something about these stoner dudes in these states do it. Like, Romero, Huber down in Texas. Like, that crew for Chance to Massacre should have rioted and been like, we're done with you, bro. But they were like, we'll do it. We'll stick it through. Well, I imagine Hooper gave a lot of his pep talks like with a chainsaw. And I wouldn't yeah, want to cross that guy. He probably offered lots of pot. He's like, look, guys, guys, I can't solve the heat. That's natural. But <laughs> I've got a lot have... of weed. I've got a lot of head cheese. What are we going to do? <laughs> what are we? Huh? Huh? <laughs> Let's make a movie. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so that's that's the cast. Um, Johnny was one of the producers. Like everyone, basically, was a producer or a makeup guy or a visual effects guy. Nobody was just one thing. Everyone helped out. Reminded me a lot of Halloween, where Carpenter was just like, "Can somebody carry this?" And Jamie Lee Curtis was like, "Sure." <laughs> we don't have anyone to pay to do this, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, Night of the Living Dead has an IMDb score of seven point eight. Rotten Tomatoes score of 96%. Due to its public domain status, it's next to impossible to determine how much money this film has made over the years. But its first run estimates are around $30 million on a budget of only $115,000, which is amazing. Yeah, I'll say this. It's probably, I would say without a doubt, it's hands down probably one of the most successful independent films of all time. Like, yeah. it's probably up there with Halloween, Friday the 13th, uh, the original, you know, Saw, um, all these independent, like, hits that you hear about all the time paranormal activity obviously uh, being one i'm sure it's in there without a doubt i think the most profitable film of all time is still the blair witch project in terms of budget versus gross oh yeah because that was made for like i think only like five thousand maybe even less it was made like it was like fifty or sixty thousand dollars and it grossed like three hundred (laughs) million yeah it was made for an obscene small amount of money that made an obscene amount of money in the box office yeah that's kind of success you know most 
producers can only dream of. But uh, yeah, Night of the Living Dead is up there. It's arguably the most important horror film in cinema history, changing the scope of what a horror movie was capable of showing its audience. So with that, let's talk some highlights of this thing. Um, Throughout, personally, I love how the camera is almost constantly tilted. Like it's keeping you completely uneasy the whole time. You're watching something unravel here. Yeah, like especially even before the zombies come out. So it's like, you know, something's up. Something's wrong, but you don't know what. Yeah, for sure. I thought that was cool. Uh, I have just in my notes, Harry Cooper is such a prick. <laughs> it's like that's like equivalence when I always make my like this chick is hot notes. <laughs> Whenever I'm just like, yep, making that note. <sighs> yeah, this chick is hot. This guy's an asshole. Moving on. <laughs> I can't ever do that on Beyond the Bags. I have to actually give her awards, even though like if you were to ask me during sex drive, it'd be a lot like just notes of like, yep main female character so hot as fuck like <laughs> she's hot she's hot a lot of tits in the sunray version <laughs> i'm sure we'll still find a way to talk about that <laughs> oh we will um yeah no i i like the opening scene a lot with the graveyard and how we quickly get set up with brava and um johnny and you know we get the immortal line that's been fucking reference ad nauseum the they're coming to get you, Barbara. You know. My favorite was Shaun of the Dead when Ed screams on the phone, we're coming to get you, Barbara. <laughs> that was my favorite version. <laughs> Romero apparently didn't catch that when they fir- when he first saw the film. Somebody had to remind him, like, that's a reference to your stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he forgot. <laughs> Don't you point that gun at Barbara? <laughs> Oh, Ed, God. never change. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting way to start out. They're talking about some, you know, like it took us forever to get out here. Johnny's just bitching, like I don't want to put flowers on Dad's grave. God damn it! Like, wow, you sound like a great guy. Well, what we don't know. Maybe Johnny got beaten like a motherfucker by his dad. He's like, fuck that guy. He's dead. I do love that he's like, but it's Barbara's like, but mom, you know, never get like, mom would want it, and he's like, well, why isn't she out here? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't fight with Johnny. Be like, yeah, well, why isn't mom out here? She wants to do this. <laughs> three hours there, three hours back, five minutes to put the wreath on. Yeah, okay, I get it, Johnny. I'd be pissed too. Yeah, I'd be mean, like, especially because to assume again it being the 1960s, men had, well, men had the same egos. We just, they were left unchecked more than they are now. Um, so I would assume that Johnny in no way know what how was going to let a woman drive his car. So I'm gonna assume Johnny drove there and back, which would also make him extra angry. Which I would just probably be like, then don't be a bitch and let your sister drive, Johnny. Take a nap. I mean, to be fair, she did drive later and plowed it right into a tree. That's, well, she oh, that's not fair. There was a zombie <laughs> baby. <laughs> that is so unfair. Just playing the asshole, just playing the asshole. <laughs> dick <laughs> well yeah that first zombie is a uh, pretty hardcore and just attacks doesn't eat johnny just <laughs> beats him to death i would have loved i don't know why i just saw it like if like a wrestling thing had just popped up entering the ring on the right we have johnny you hear the d- the, the ring of a bell and like john cena's music starts playing and you're just like what's going on <laughs> all of a sudden the zombie just looks at me and goes can you smell what the rock is cooking? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, she hightails it out of there pretty quickly, and the zombie just shambles after her. After she watches Shiny get his ass kicked by the zombie, and then his head hit on the on the tombstone. Oh yeah, I forgot that he came back at the end as a zombie, and that was genuinely shocking. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> cool. Okay, you've seen this one before, so you're like, oh, plot twist. <laughs> didn't, didn't see this coming. Have you seen this one before? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm surprised. <laughs> I've seen this one time before, and it was like six years ago. So, and I had to, I didn't remember uh, that bit, and I was like, oh, cool. Oh, I've seen this like 50 times. <laughs> <laughs> I anticipated the moment. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. Uh, she makes it to the farmhouse. Doesn't say another word for like an hour. 
Uh, ben Almost shows up and he's if we're being honest. Ben shows up and he's like, I got a truck. And weirdly, this farmhouse has a gas pump outside. Was that a thing? And people had their own gas. I don't maybe. I mean, 60s were a wild time. Um, I do like how he shows up. He's trying to talk to her. At no point is she talking, but he doesn't shut the fuck up. And he just accepts her. He's like, yeah, let's just board this place up and you can just chill here. I'll just keep talking to you and you won't say a word because I don't know what the fuck's going on anymore. Elvin, he's like, go get some wood. And then she does it. He's like, look, <laughs> we need to do this together. Now go get some wood. And she comes back with like three little like blocks of wood. And he's got a fucking door. He's he's pinning up on the wall. It's like way to contribute there, Barb's. Good job. Good job, Barbara. <laughs> I do like how she like, and I, I okay, you know what I get it because like she runs from that scenario, finds the farmhouse, technically finds the dead fucking eaten owner. So it's like, I get it. She just went to a fucking house of horrors in her mind after being outside to horrors, and it's like, oh shit, okay, you're just not catching a break. True. True. I wonder why that body upstairs didn't come back. I don't know. Maybe its brains were already done. That's true. The eyes looked off. Somebody bashed that head in. I do love how how long everyone like downstairs waits to come up. They hear commotion. They hear people talking. They hear steps, and they just don't do anything. And then they do come up briefly, and everyone's like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> I would have the same thing. Like. The- First, I'd be like, first, I'm mad that I didn't even bother to check the basement because <laughs> rookie mistake. And saying, I'd be like, wait, how long were you guys down there? I would be like, man, I was like, how long have you been down there? I love that when, when uh, Mr. Cooper's like, look, the cellar's the best place. I know what I'm doing and I'm taking some of this stuff. I love Ben's like, is this your house? <laughs> and he doesn't answer. <laughs> it's like, he avoids that question. Clearly, it's not your house. Yeah, no. And I do like how he just, he's like, well, we heard commotion and stuff out there. He's like, well, wait, first you didn't hear us, and now you said you heard us. What's get your story straight, man? <laughs> yeah, Cooper's just uh, you know, he's a he's an asshole, but he's an asshole protecting his daughter. And he's like, you know, he's got to make some decisions. Uh, how that all pans out, by the way, holy fuck! I remember seeing that as a as a young kid, just uh. Karen stabbing her mom with the trowel and wondering, like, what is this? <laughs> I do like I like the music that plays because it is like legitimately kind of creepy and it's it's so weird. Yeah, it's weird that like Karen doesn't try, she eats dad, but she didn't try to eat mom, she just stabs mom to death. Mom wasn't an asshole. <laughs> mom looks like like dad died of the gunshot wound. Mom got way worse. I mean, that looked painful. Yeah, she got stabbed a lot. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love when the car explodes because it's not at all what you're expecting. You think like audience in 68 are like, you know, happy endings were everything in Hollywood. That was part of the Hayes Code. The movie had to end on a good note. The bad guy had to lose. So to have a movie like this come out where everyone dies. (laughs) No one survives. Yeah. And gradually just again in in horrific accidents, like, you know, accidentally putting gas on the fucking torch and lighting up their only means of escape. When the dude pulled the damn thing out of like the the nozzle out of the tank, there you go. Pull the nozzle out of the pump. I, I got I'm getting my terms right eventually. Um, and I saw the gas flying. You and I was like, "What the fuck are you doing, dude?" Like the gas is flying everywhere. That's such a bad idea. I bet that was real gas too. I mean, that shit went up fast. So like, I wonder if Romero was just like, "We got one shot at this. You guys better get out of that truck." <laughs> holy hell oh and then the zombies just swarm the truck and start eating some some barbecue which is just rough jesus i can only imagine this is also one happen. of the first this is also one of the first uh naked asses in movie in american movie history so you know what it's a good ass too i'm proud of that ass it was it was a nice ass i agree it was a nice zombie ass um you think the crew, you think they got excited at the thought of like barbecued human flesh? They were like, oh my God, something different. <laughs> we're having barbecue tonight, boys. <laughs> oh my God. That'd be hilarious. They're just like, mm, like <laughs> enjoying it. Oh my God. 
This has nothing to do with it. Someone's like, no, give me the white meat. I don't want the dark meat. Instead of going brains, one of them's going sauce. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Who oh. wants the breast? Best part is these are all parts of what we eat on a chicken. So it sounds racist. It sounds bad. But there's white meat, dark meat, breast, thigh. It all works out. Yeah. Someone had to eat the dick. I'm not talking chicken anymore. Someone had to... Yeah, I'll, I'm taking it there. <laughs> one, of those, one of those zombies ate the dick. He... Because it's 1968, a very closeted zombie is like, give me that dick. I'm going to eat that dick. <laughs> he says it just like that. Like he's, it overtakes the zombie like mindset. All of a sudden he's just like, Gah! give it. <laughs> oh my God, that'd be funny. You know what's uh, crazy? This has nothing to do with zombies. So I finally have um, kind of been going through my fucking stack of like unread comics and stuff like that i finally whipped open maniac uh we're killing number two from my bond press um after like it just sitting in my collection finally cracked it open because after they finally they're doing they're getting ready to ship escape from me on which means maniac issue three is gonna come out so i was like oh i didn't read issue two uh holy goddamn shit was there a scene i didn't expect thing and this had me i don't know how dick well talking about a zombie eating dick led to this moment um but uh, there's a like uh, there's a part where I saw a man bite and rip out a clit as he was going down, woman, and it was in graphic detail. And wow, I wasn't ready, but I don't know if the Ibon guys listen to our podcast. So I know we did that team up, but if you do, bravo! Because holy shit, I was not ready for that scene. Bra fucking oh, holy hell! Wow. And- if you're listening, I absolutely cannot wait for Escape from Beyond and um, Maniac Roadkill issue number three. God, can I cannot wait now? <laughs> yeah, that was cool when we got to do that. Um, <laughs> shit, that now I have that visual. Wonderful. It, I have the actual visual because I read the comic. I will show you if I have to when you get here. Well, yeah, you have to. I need to. That. I don't need to see it, but I, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically, everyone just kind of dies of their own stupidity. And Barbara, I feel like, gets the worst of it because she gets dragged into the horde and never seen again. Yeah, I, yeah her death, like, especially because she sees Johnny, she's like, Oh, Johnny. And at first, you think like, she's like fully snapped now, but then you got you actually are like, Oh, no, God, no, someone help me. And I'm like, Ben, get over there, be her protector that you've been throughout the whole hour and a half of this movie. And, and he doesn't get there in time. You see her get dragged in, and I'm like, oh, God. Any film, any zombie media, I should say, that always shows, like, some poor sap getting, like, dragged into the horde just, oh, I mean, looks horrific. The few times they've showed us, uh, Shaun of the Dead, obviously, we talked about recently, graphic, um, you know, Day of the Dead itself, you know, with Captain Rhodes. Um, I don't know if you got this far on it, but in The Walking Dead, there's that one scene. I forget the fucking character, but it's like those revolving doors. Noah. Noah, the wrong. I remember. I remember that. Yeah, and he's like pressed against it and getting like they do not pull back. Horrifically fucking eaten by a horde. Oh my! I remember someone going. I was like, look. I'm gonna say right now, if there's like a zombie apocalypse, like I'm either gonna fight. Or before they eat me, I'm killing myself because fuck me. And not that bullshit where it's like I have the last bullet and it doesn't fucking actually fire and then I'm gonna eat anyway. Um, I've seen that in something, I forget what what already so much zombie media. Um, but yeah, because those horde things and like Night Living Dead, right? And this Night Living Dead, Walking Dead, Sean, like, no, I don't want that. That looks painful and terrible. I've already decided that if a zombie apocalypse ever happens, I'm leaping off the first tall building I can find. I'm not dealing with that. I don't want to deal with the you know warlord people, and I don't want to deal with getting ripped apart by a zombie. So I'm just gonna go fucking. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. There was a episode of The Walking Dead. They threw a guy off the roof. He didn't die. It was on purpose. Like he was a bad guy. He didn't die, and he is like fucking paralyzed as zombies are eating him. Even I was like, that is kind of actually pretty gnarly. What oh, was just- that? 
Was that in a newer episode? Because I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was in a newer episode. Shit. It was, it was not too long after I texted you that Michael Bean's in The Walking Dead. It wasn't Michael Bean. But I was just like, yeah, it wasn't too long after me when you got that text going. Right? This really Michael Bean in The Walking Dead? <laughs> He's been getting random, weird, like he was in Walking Dead, he was in a Mandalorian, like he's been getting an interesting, uh, you know, little boosts. And I, I hope, I hope he gets to have something substantial. I hope he's, uh, hope he's, uh, sober, and that's what's happening here, and we're getting a nice little yeah. like comeback. Yeah, I hope so too. This is credit. He delivered. He was really good in his uh, brief appearance in The Walking Dead. I liked him. The future's not set, Michael Bean. You can, you can still fix yourself. You got this, calories. <laughs> oh um hicks <laughs> i think he's johnny ringo in tombstone yeah, yeah I'm, your, I'm your huckleberry um line makes no sense but it's so goddamn good i can explain to you the origin of that it basically means i will hold your I, i'll be your pallbearer he's basically saying like i'm gonna kill you and i'm gonna be at your funeral so i'm your huckleberry means like a huckleberry was somebody who held like it was a pallbearer so that's what he's saying that's fucking stone cold shit to say i know right yeah i will hold your coffin at your funeral you son of a bitch after i have killed you <laughs> yeah that's that's a oh. bad shit to say to somebody <laughs> all right yeah from context i always thought it meant like i'll be your best friend but no it's the opposite <laughs> i forgot what i was gonna say love tombstone um great movie the uh Disney film. I need to point that out. Really? Yeah, it's uh before they had 20th Century Studio, they had a thing called Brena Vista Home Entertainment. Buena Vista, that's right. I remember Brena Vista, that. and that was what they used. Now, now they use 20th Century in order to get more adult stuff out. So Tombstone is a fucking is a Disney film. I'll, I'll take it. That's awesome. Uh, Ben gets killed by the people who are there to save everybody so that's nice and uh and that's what i was talking about the nihilistic ending that Romero is so known for having like you know like you said an american hollywood ending especially at that time less so nowadays i think we've been more open to not having constant yeah. happy endings but back in the um, day like during the, the age of classic hollywood like it was forced it was like if you need to have everything has to work out yeah and so to have this kind of ending where he does make it out and, you know, obviously even I'm thinking like, why did you look through the window? Just walk out, like walk outside. They're clearly not that trigger happy to shoot anything. They see like they, 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 for once to their credit, the cops were even, I was like, this is actually kind of a well-ordered machine. It looks like they're assessing each scenario, but not just randomly shooting. They're making sure like this kind of well-ordered machine. Um, no, he looks out the window though. And I'm like, well, yeah, dude, that's why they think you're fucking, you're just peeking at them like an, a like an asshole. <laughs> priority one, zombies, priority two, assholes. So yeah. we're fucked. But, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it really plays into that, that nihilism that Romero would become so known for. And you think you're going to get this happy ending and no, nah, he gets shot square in the head. And most part is like because he's dead, they don't know. Like even when they take him, they don't know that he was a human. He could have easily been a, a freshly turned zombie. Yeah, bummer. Um, here are some film guys and facts for Night of the Living Dead. Thought this was interesting. George Romero originally hired Tom Savini to do the makeup effects for the film. The two were introduced when Savini auditioned for an acting role in an earlier film that never got off the ground. Romero, remembering that Savini was also a makeup artist, called Savini to, to the set of his horror movie. Savini was unable to do the effects because he was in the U.S. Army, serving as a combat photographer in Vietnam. Savini later appeared in Dawn of the Dead and directed a remake of Night of the Living Dead. So Romero and Savini, would, like he had him in mind from day one. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, uh, Romero, uh, Savini talked about that on interviews and in this documentary. I don't know if you've seen it on Shutter Caught Smoke and Mirrors, Tom Savini's story. I, I wanted to check that out. I did. I saw it in the list. It, it's really, really good. And he talks about that in that they, they got a queen because they were working in the same area. I mean, they're both they're from the same area and they were working it together. And his, his dad was doing stuff in the area. So it's like it was a mutual like thing that kind of happened. Words collided perfectly. And um, 
he he said he he stated it's one of the biggest regrets of his life not being able to do Night of Living Dead, but it worked out because he said like you know he was like thank God, you know when it happened you know I, he you know he went and did his thing in Nam, he came back and he's like he said that and he said he'll credit it was all Romero, he's like thank God he remembered me, and you know we met up again and he's like hey, and he offered me a chance again on on Don so that was all thankfully. You know, thanks to Romero that we essentially got Tom Savini because he remembered him. You know, they, they had met up again and he offered him Dawn of the Dead. Said, hey, I'm working on this and I really want to give you a shot. You want to do it this time? And he's like, yes. That's awesome. And apparently he almost said no. He had he screams out in our crosswords in life and he almost said no because he said he already asked me once. And I knew if I did said no again, I'd lose my only other shot I had. So I said yes and took a chance. I'm glad he did that because we got Tom Savini. Mm. Um, I watched this documentary that was uh, taped off like a TV special. It was something my uh, my uncle had it as a kid on tape. And my mom was able to track it down from like a DVD capture that uh, she got on eBay. It was called Scream Greats. Uh, Tom Savini, Master of Horror Effects from 1986. And it was like fresh off Day of the Dead. It was him talking about Dawn and Day and like how he made all of his makeup effects and it was like how he worked. And that was really cool to get to see the nitty gritty of like what he puts into his work. And so much of it is so basic shit that he just turns into magic. And that's so cool. Yeah. Well, and also in Savini's case, like he bases so much of his makeup on um, his time in Nam. Yeah. A lot of it is stuff he's seen and um, and he has taken pictures of. Ugh. He just applied it to horror movies, makeup effects. That's why he's... I hope Maniac doesn't count in there. <laughs> it does. The head exploding. He saw that shit. I'm sure he's seen some. He took pictures. Like when he took pictures, it was, you know, sometimes after battle and he saw horrific shit. And mm-hmm. he said that's how he got a lot of his his ideals. A lot of what he does is based off his knowledge of how what happens to the human body thanks to his time in Nam. good lord that paints his films in a whole different light um number two according to the george romero commentary track on the laser disc and dvd version of the film the original working print and working elements and materials for the film no longer exist they were destroyed as a result of a flood that filled the basement where the materials were stored which was the same basement used in the movie. The farmhouse did not have a basement, so they filmed the basement scenes in a uh, uh, soundstage area. So that basement is where they stored the film. Basement flooded. The original print of Night of the Living Dead was lost forever. It sucks. Jesus. It's amazing how, oh boy, how we we almost lose so many films (laughs) or how many films had been lost to time. Oh, I hate thinking about that. There's so many movies out there that were never saved, were lost in a fire, some asshole took off with it. There's it's gone. Like, did you know that um Ernest Hemingway had his uh before he he um uh, wrote like you know his most famous works, he had a suitcase full of uh drafts of stuff he was working with that he told his wife to bring him uh bring to him, and she left it on the fucking train and it disappeared. So there's like a dozen or so Ernest Hemingway originals that are lost to time and still people are still hunting for them. God damn it. That's grounds for divorce. As far as I'm concerned, <laughs> like that's, that's at the very least going to require some therapy. Babe, we had a good run, but uh, you apparently can't remember a simple task. You lost my work, all my work. That's that's income. So um it's not like he rewrote that shit. He was like, eh, moving on. Because that's how a lot of writers do. A lot of writers don't rewrite what they lose. They're just like, eh, fuck it, moving on. <laughs> Which is wild. Unless you're king, you just shove it, possibly use it for fucking your fifth novel of the year. <laughs> no, he's lost some stuff too. I was I was reading into that. Uh, there was a novel he wrote called like The Leprechaun or something like that. It was like 500 page manuscript that fell off his bike and like blew into the wind. And he just lost it. God damn it. So he just is like, eh, moving on. And I can't, I can't imagine writing 500 pages of something and then you lose it. And then you just have to be like, eh, them's the breaks. And you just continue on to a new project. Right. I, I might blow my brains out. Like that's so much work. 
Jesus Christ. That's a lot of work. I've never written anything that long before. Like I, I can't imagine. That's three of my books. Yeah, but King, as we've seen, the dude pumps out two or three books a year. So he's just like, yeah, I'll just come up with something oh, else. I'm sure there's no sweat off his ass, but like for someone like me, I, that's that's a life ruined right there. Right. If you're like George R. R. Martin, you're you're done. Your career that is is shot. What if that's what happened and he's he's scared to tell anybody? <laughs> Instead, he's just, you know berating and blaming fans and i'm like well finish the book you fucking idiot he left the book at taco bell or something and when he went back it was gone and now he's like i don't know i don't know how to tell people (laughs) i was almost done he's just like if i just immerse myself in all this other shit i don't need to immerse myself in (laughs) i'm now gonna go with the idea that he just left it at a restaurant and he can't he's just scared to tell people no i will not give him the the dignity of a restaurant fast food joint that's harsh <laughs> and it's your book i don't I like read game of thrones i feel like he spends a lot of time at long john silvers i don't know why but specifically that one place specific i was thinking waffle house i think it's the hat <laughs> why why waffle house he, he's not going to pay the extra money for ihop <laughs> jesus christ oh that's funny uh, what is it? Was it Jim Norton that made that fucking Waffle House joke about it being called Awful House? That was Jim Gaffigan. Jim Gaffigan. That Jim Norton's of, not making jokes about waffles. That's true. That's one of the few Jim Gaffigan jokes that makes me laugh. I don't know why he's that one comedian that I just have never been able to get into. Good old Jim Gaffigan. I like. I I've kind of his stuff has kind of gotten pretty repetitive, but I do remember like his first special. I liked his off his Waffle House bit. Like where he's like, and it's not just because smoke watching someone smoke a cigarette while they're frying an egg reminds me of my father. <laughs> like, that was a good bit. Yeah, the Waffle House did make me laugh. That one made me laugh. Um, and now number three of Film Guys and Facts. This one's gruesome. Or, originally, one idea for the script called for Harry Cooper to die from the gunshot wound received from Ben before his daughter became a zombie, which would have resulted in Helen coming downstairs to find him eating their daughter. Uh, rather than the daughter eating him. It was decided this would probably be far too disturbing and graphic, and was changed back to the idea of the daughter becoming a zombie first. I feel yeah. I feel like this movie might have been... Uh, I mean, it was already a lot for people. So to watch a guy eat his daughter, I think probably would have been too... People would have shut this up. They would have shut down. Maybe would have pushed it over the line a bit. Yeah. I think... I mean, now you could probably get away with it. I mean, I've seen the fucking sadness, for Christ's sakes uh but back then no no well i also like to think like if the envelope had been pushed that hard right at the get-go movies like friday the 13th halloween like would they have gotten gone even further like would the idea of just like watching a child get ripped apart be like completely meaningless to us now in movies because we've seen actors are actors are actually getting killed and friday 13th they're like look you're going to sign up for like one movie and we're probably going to kill you. It becomes such a big part of pop culture that nowadays it's like all the actors are like at death row inmates who are like, this is how they're going to go. <laughs> That's actually kind of a cool idea. <laughs> this is how we killed them. Like how, like, how are you going out? The movie. <laughs> oh, you're in the movie. <laughs> Oh, you got that one. It's like fucking it's like a version of Gamer come to life. Was it? It was, I think it was one of, I don't remember where I was watching, but somebody was talking about like, if it was just like the porno, like there was only one porn. It was like, what are you doing tonight? I'm watching the porn. Like it was just one movie <laughs> and everyone just had the same movie. You were like, that was all you could, all you had. Like, what if that was like that for the movies? It's like there was only one movie out there. It's like, what are you doing tonight? Watching the movie. Again? <laughs> it's a really good movie. <laughs> What's a sequel? Never heard of that. <laughs> ah, funny. Uh, so the film is remade countless times due to its public domain status. Uh, but the most notable is the 1990 version directed by Tom Savini, which has been fairly celebrated by horror fans. Um, I haven't seen it personally, but I know Josh is a big fan. It, I know I know. I like to give you shit because you always tell me like films are hard to find. Then I get on Amazon and I, I find it. Um, but legitimately, as far as I know, this particular Night Living Dead is an actual bitch to get. Um, well, I have it. 
Yeah, I think you got you got a DVD of it, right? Still have it. Still counts. No, I'm just saying you have a you got your, your hands on a DVD copy, right? You yeah. Fucking talk. Um, God. I can I was, tell with the tone. You're like, yeah, but it's DVD. Yeah, I mean, you might as well not have it. Yeah, I need you to upgrade that shit to Blu-ray. Give it the times, you piece of shit. Um, but it is a legit like that one. Like, I've I've looked up just blind to try to blind buy, and like they keep doing these like limited press event. I'm like, just fucking put it out. Why is it such a bitch to get this movie? I don't know, but honestly, if you just accept that certain movies, you can like if you just get a DVD copy to watch it. Like I was, I was reading an article about movies that are hard to get a hold of, and I owned like eight of them because I was willing to buy DVD, like Cocoon. Oh no! Magna. Look, like, no, I have look them. if it doesn't have a Blu-ray, but it has like if it if I can find the DVD, that's fine. I'm look, I, I oh god, and of course there's there's a foreign issue that's actually being sold for goddamn twenty two dollars every goddamn time. <laughs> get a region free. I have a region free. See, I'm like you have a region the, free. Then what's the problem? The fact that I was once again fucking wrong, because of course, god damn it. I don't like how Amazon does this to me every time. Like, oh yeah, it's a bitch to get. And then Amazon's like, no, it's not. It's right here. That's your version of me saying, you know, I don't think this is going to, I don't think this is going to come out then. And then it does. Like, that's, <laughs> this is yours. You've done that so many times to me on like superhero films. You're like, oh, I don't think it's coming out. And then like a week later, like, so the trailer has come out. And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, keep this rolling. Keep saying it's not coming out. <laughs> I get footage out of it. Keep saying you can't find these Blu-rays. Maybe I'll be able to get one. Right? I'm just we're just whirling shit into existence. Oh no, yeah, there's a fucking god damn it. Well, Prime Day is uh tomorrow as we're recording. <laughs> I might make another fucking massive movie order for no good reason. There's you don't need a reason. It's what we do. <laughs> Uh, Romero's series continued with 1978's Dawn of the Dead, which follows a group of survivors who hole up in an abandoned shopping mall surrounded by hordes of the living dead. And uh, the debate between, you know, Night and Dawn, like which one's the best one, is kind of ongoing for horror fans. Both are celebrated on pretty much equal grounds. Uh, personally, I'm more of a Dawn guy. I, yeah, like I... <coughs> Sorry, I still have the coughing effects of fucking my COVID. Um, I'm more of a Don guy myself. Um, I really, to me, it's, just, but it's not like, it is a case where it's just a sequel just really outshining the original in the sense that like the original, it's kind of like Alien Aliens to an extent for those who find Aliens better. I know that's a, that's a little bit more of a spice for debate. I know that's one of them. Or if you prefer Scream Scream 2, ever, you know, insert any fucking sequel you find better, right? But a case where, like, you had a, you really did have a great, just fucking exceptional first film in Night of the Living Dead. But with Dawn, you have a more confident, a more assured, a little bit more tools at his uh, disposal. Like, you just have, like, a, a guy that I think it was almost 10 years later, if not 10 years later. 10 years later, yeah, 68 to yeah, 78. Yeah, a whole decade later that Dawn came out. A guy that just honed his craft and made an even more confident more assured just just all around for me better film again i'm saying that as someone it's like i really like nine living dead and i will get to our scores and you'll see what i mean but yeah don is just like he just improved on everything on an already great film so it's like yeah i'm, I'm a don guy i'm with josh i love don the dead don not dead. as much as he does but i love it yeah i've seen his his like really cool version and it's like neat that's another movie that's incredibly difficult to get a hold of. So why don't you why don't you say some some words about the Dawn of the Dead Blu-ray? <laughs> I need to do that, the Dawn of the Dead, and um, Return of the Living Dead because that one is legitimately also a bitch to get. Yeah. Um, I've got Night, Day, and Land on Blu-ray. Good editions. I can't fucking find Dawn. <laughs> it's, it's a bummer. I think uh, you need to get yourself a region free Blu-ray player, but I think the the British one that I showed you that Josh has is still available, but you just gotta get a region free Blu-ray player. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know why you didn't just do a region free Blu-ray, because then you would have had DVDs covered as well. 
because I got the region free DVD player was like 40 bucks. The region free Blu-ray player was like 180 bucks. Oh my God. 180 bucks. That's a lot of money to me. And I needed the DVD player like immediately for a, uh, for an Oscar Sunday podcast. So I was like, I need to watch this movie now. I need that now. So it wasn't so much. I'm going to get this so I can watch things. It was, I'm going to get this so I can watch this movie right now. So it was an impulse, immediate purchase. I wasn't looking to add to my, my, you know, home theater entertainment system. No, so, see, I got mine to add to it, especially because foreign countries like physical media more than America does, apparently. They, they do. So there's. I will get one. I do yeah, want to get one so I can start shopping for international Blu-rays. I do want. Oh, so yeah, there's there's um there's some international companies. There's things that rumored I've heard coming out. Um, that had me excited. Like I said, I definitely have to start getting that copy of Dawn of the Dead that uh, Josh has. That actually, I might pick up the British version of Anaconda because it actually has a second film on Blu-ray. The one DVD that's still in your collection, Anaconda. Yeah, if, it's fine too. It won't be bad if I bought more. And I'm again, I'm not opposed to buying. I will get the highest quality that the film is on. I actually have two DVDs coming in the mail because I doubt these films are ever getting Blu-ray releases, but. <laughs> They're not good movies, but dear God, if they're not entertaining, and I'm going to have them in my collection. Um, I have a cousin who still buys VHS tapes. Okay, that's a little crazy. That's yeah. No offense. I look. I know those collectors out there. I just like look. They're still making DVD players. I'll just put it like that. They're not making VHS players. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just saying. Buy it. Unless it's one of those, and it does happen, some VHS does not make the leap to DVD. That's the unfortunate thing with new, when we switch to new formats, that it doesn't always make the leap. And actually, they've talked about that, like, less and less gets ported over. Um, so in that case, I get it. Keep your VHS copy of that film by all means. But again, I'll stand by it. Get the best. I'm a fan of getting, I know, I, I know you should, I know your financial situation, I get it. But I'm very much like a, what you're, you have to be thrifty right now because you're a TA <laughs> and you're currently on summer vacation. I am making just enough to get by. And that is, that is, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not shaming. <laughs> I'm just saying I all joking aside, I get it. I'm just saying for me personally, I try to get the best possible quality that I can. Now with that said, I know obviously 4k is coming out unless I fucking love the movie. I'm not upgrading all my damn blue race. It's, it's not happening. I mean, you're going to, it's something I actually really love. And they have a lot of maybe some new special features, something like that, right? To entice me. Or I'm buying it for the first time and they yeah, have the 4K is available. So yeah, I'll just fucking get the 4K. I feel like if you'll buy Halloween five, you'll buy pretty much anything. I wasn't just going to get Halloween one. They had all five of them. You silly goose. <laughs> I just see it right there and I'm like, yeah, if you love you love quite a lot of movies. So I feel like this is gonna be bit of an overall yeah. look at this look at this beauty of a movie it's a how I'm, I'm, okay. I'm okay with it because whatever you replace i am probably going to get in the mail so everything works out <laughs> look halloween five is, is it's a movie it's that's true of all the movies that have ever been made it is certainly one of them it's a movie <laughs> that has some very interesting choices they made with michael myers and the storyline I gotta stop watching all this shit in one night because I'm I, I can't differentiate it from Halloween four. <laughs> I just it does it does make for an entertaining marathon, especially when I don't know why I have found it so funny when you did the 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 Loomis thing. <laughs> I, that was a, a combination of just like being overheated and just lom, you know bombarded with Halloween movies that just I don't know I was just trying to entertain myself. <laughs> And then somehow you broke me. I remember that was uh, that was a good that was amazing. I've never made you laugh that hard ever. That was that was fun. Yeah, good times. Uh, 1985's Day of the Dead follows a different group of survivors in an underground bunker, experimenting with the dead and trying to figure out their next move. Of the franchise, this is my personal favorite. Uh, I love this movie. I think I love Bubba. Or Bub, I believe. Not Bubba. You call him Bub. It's Bub. Bub. Get it mixed up. And then Rhodes is just one of the most evil, slimy bastards in movie history. And his 
His death is so fucking satisfying. And, and, and so over the top, like, villainy. And I love how he yells every fucking thing. I just love, you know, choke on it. Choke on it as he's being ripped in half. It's like, oh, my God. I just love how it's like he I love because like you know it's fine so so many this film had a weird like thing where like it didn't do that great actually I've heard considered a disappointment and it's recently found it's or not even recently it's found it's love and now considered one of the you know one of his best films. Yeah. But I remember one thing that I remember I read a negative review and someone's like, all they do is yell, and I was like, No, they don't. And I watched it, and I'm like, no, they yell a lot in this movie. Captain Rhodes yells consistently. <laughs> He's the only, is he the only person in movie history to be shot by a zombie? I think so. <laughs> That's great. I do not love that. Oh, uh, it was great. I loved all, uh, Day of the Dead. I love Day of the Dead. It's a great movie. Long overdue for a rewatch. I got to just sit down and a dawn. Once I get the dawn Blu ray, I'm going to do a dawn day back to back, and that's going to be a fun day. Ooh, that's going to be a good day. Yeah. Then there's 2005's Land of the Dead which focuses on a walled city of survivors who have coped with the fact that the dead now rule the world and are getting smarter. And this was, you know, 20 years between day and land. So Romero had some time to work, work on this one. And uh, I like it a lot of, you know, there's some people who don't like it. I, I happen to like it. My uncle was a huge fan named his dog Riley after uh, Simon Baker's character in this movie. Okay. I didn't even know that. Um, Yeah. My his dog's full name is Riley Denbo. That was the full name. That's the character's name in the movie. That <laughs> makes sense now. Um, yeah, it's funny because like this is actually the the only dead film that he worked with a budget. It's a, it's a budget, quote unquote, because he actually had a studio backing with this one, um, which is why it's one along with Night, one of the easiest ones to get your hands on in a series because it was a very studio backed. For you know that they helped him out a lot. They gave him what they needed. And, you know, what I like about it, and I, because a lot of people like to come after Land of the Dead, um, but what I liked about it was that it still felt like a remote, even with it being studio backed and studio finance, and then kind of going all the way to help them out. It still felt like a Romero zombie film. It still felt like a Romero film. So felt like he definitely had control of what he wanted to do with it and told his story, and they left him alone. And I, I really enjoy it. I really like it. I, it feels like a natural progression before you essentially reset it with diary um but a natural progression of where we were at from night all the way here to now land land is special for me because it's the first time i ever saw in a horror film somebody's head get ripped open like this was the first time for me i've seen it a lot of times since you know hatchet dead snow but this was the first time i saw yeah. some the guys hmm? was like hatchet's still my favorite fucking take on it but yeah I, yeah, I agree. That was I can't quite see the seam between actor and puppet with that, with that, and that's great. Yeah, but yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's when somebody grabs the upper jaw and just pulls. <laughs> yeah, and in Hatchet, they dude, how Adam Green pulls that off with like Victor Crowley's doing it. The camera's just moving around, so you're just kind of seeing it more and more. It's like, oh my god, it's fucking, it's 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 great. <laughs> yeah, some gnarly shit. Uh, then there was 2007's Diary of the Dead, in which Romero tried to capitalize on the found footage phenomenon and did a hard reset of his zombie universe uh, through found footage. I haven't seen this one yet. Uh, I've heard pretty bad things. It's all right. I saw it once and I was like, yeah, this is okay. Um, it, uh, it, yeah, it, you could tell, like, to me, it was just like, the story's not interesting because he's just, I, I don't know if he was necessarily trying to capitalize on the file. I don't know. I don't know too much on the history of making of that. If it was him like trying hard to capitalize on found footage or not. Just remember being like, this is okay. Like I don't I'm not feeling this one like the other movies. Yeah, that's kind of everyone's thoughts on these last two. Uh finally, 2009 Survival of the Dead focuses on survivors on an island trying to find a cure for the zombie plague. And uh, yeah, I've I I, I, I tried to watch this. A long time ago, it was like the first year where Netflix had streaming and the buffering was so bad. I gave up within five minutes. So I've never seen the movie. <laughs> God, I remember. I remember those years when. God, I remember when we first signed up for Net, when we decided to do the streaming thing, we quit it because the buffering was always like terrible. That's, yeah. how I saw, I mean, that's how I watched Paranormal Activity. I was like, oh, shit, they have it on. Little teenage me is like, they have Paranormal Activity? Oh, my God. <laughs> 
I watched that. I remember it worked because no one was on the internet. I watched it at night and it streamed fine. I remember being like, guys, the Netflix streaming works. And my parents were like, no, it doesn't. Yeah, you got to do it when no one else is using the internet. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, well, yeah, because you guys are doing it during the day. And then, yeah, we got rid of it. Oh, those were the days. I remember just having to, you know, we used to have to fight to access the internet in the house. You had to be like, you had to hope no one else was using it. You had like, those were the days. I'm so yeah. glad we fixed that as a society. Yeah, right. <laughs> the thing like had like that Netflix streaming could have fucking crashed hard, but everyone just was like, you know what? This is kind of cool. We just kind of need the internet for it. <laughs> if Netflix streaming had crashed so much would never have happened. I can't imagine what the landscape would look like today. If that hadn't happened. Physical media would still be a beautiful thing. I can tell you that much in America. That's true. But how much, like how many shows or movies wouldn't have been green lit? And like how many careers wouldn't happen? How many, you know, what would co- would COVID have killed the movie industry? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Because streaming lasts. I mean, look at uh, breakout stars on shows like The Boys or, you know, I know you hate hearing it, but Stranger Things, a lot of those young actors are having fucking fruitful careers now. And they, that's where they started. Yeah. Ooh, dangerous. I don't like thinking about that. Yeah, because yeah, one of the kids got the fucking it role because of goddamn Stranger Things. Yeah, Millie Bobby, Millie Bobby Brown, other than Creeps being a f- being fucking perverts online. There's a big thing on the news because there was a countdown to when she was turning eighteen. What the fuck? It, what? Yeah, it, oh it my was, god, it's fucking disgusting. And other than that gross factor, you know, she's getting a lot of roles now thanks to the show. You know, because she that was just a huge. So yeah. You know, without these streaming only shows, shows that have been saved. Yeah. Because of streamers. That's, yeah. There's no, you know, there's no Prime Video. There's no Shutter. There's no Disney Plus. Like, none of that ever happens. God damn, that's crazy to think about. Yeah. Creepy. Ah. Maybe we are in the, in the, in the good timeline. Sometimes. Artistically, hell yeah. Politically, fuck no. No, that 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 timeline's a bad one. Um, I I give Night of the Living Dead an eight. Still a solid watch. Trailblazer for so much that came after it. It's a good movie. I'm gonna give it a nine. It's a solid nine out of ten. This is this is a you know it's not for me. It's not a classic that's like boring or like you're like okay I respect it but I'm not really into it. No, this is a great film, and what it did for the zombie subgenre, what it did for any cinema. And the fact that, I mean, it gave us George A. Romero and, you know, to an extent, we got the Romero timeline of Don Day, all that stuff. And then, you know, we got Return of the Living Dead out of it. So, um, yeah, this is a fucking fantastic film that has led to so many more great things. Yeah. Hell yeah. This was fun. This was a good one. I knew this is going to be a big episode. Uh, it's a very important movie. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. If you like the show. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Filmgasm Productions. Uh, if you want to suggest films for us to check out, you can send us a message there. You can email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. Uh, check out our website where we have reviews, articles, episodes of our show, upcoming trailers, filmgasm.com. And if you want to support the show through Anchor, you can click on support this podcast on your podcast provider. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Next week, the gauntlet continues as we inch closer and closer to our 200th episode. It's finally time to take a trip to Camp Crystal Lake and talk about one of the most iconic horror movie villains of all time in Jason Voorhees' mother, Pamela. As we tackle... I can't tell if you almost actually fucked that up or did that... It was intentional. It was intentional. I'm not stupid. I know what this is. (laughs) We're tackling Friday the 13th. Long time coming. This is a, a big one. We've uh, we've been saving this for a special occasion. And, you know, almost 200 episodes definitely counts. We'll discuss the origins of the iconic slasher classic, touch on the many sequels, and also try to unravel the seemingly endless lawsuit that has kept any new content from being produced for some time. I am very interested in that part because I want to know how this all happened and all the frivolous litigation that's been going on for decades so i'm looking forward to that yes especially the fact that it's out of court but still ongoing now there's out of court you know at the studio decisions to be made and yeah really but yeah i know friday the 13th is a particularly special film to you so 
This is going to be exciting. Yeah, if anyone doesn't know, I'm a fucking huge fan of this franchise. I love me some Friday 13th. So I'm excited. The last time I watched any of these movies, I watched all of them uh, with you. So I have no idea where the seams are. So I'm looking forward to watching just this one. <laughs> That's how I felt after we did our Bonathon. Yeah. And I was like, let me just watch them individually over time. And I'm like, now I'm starting to be able to differentiate between them. Because after a while, they, they especially the Roger Moore era, especially... <laughs> bleed the fuck together holy god doing that doing a movie marathon of that caliber watching all the friday the 13th elm street halloween bond movies is great if you've seen them before if it's your first time that's a terrible fucking way to do that <laughs> i feel like we were we were on such like an autopilot not actually i feel like we did fine when it came to like nightmare and friday because at least those ones were an hour and a half quick like done move on to the next one yeah i remember like monathon like i feel like after like day two or just like both on autopilot watching the movies like oh god that was not the best idea i still have, i rem- i look back on that fondly but also i'm like there's no way in hell we could ever do that now my god we were I such wanna, stupid children i want to be interested now i'd be like oh god there's so much art shit i can do besides sitting through all of these consecutively i can maybe handle three four movies a day not not what that was and that's spaced out <laughs> yeah i got i got fucking pets to take care of our shit going on that it's like i got i can't do that anymore i gotta take breaks to take care of other shit real quick i'd like to leave the house <laughs> but uh yeah friday the 13th and then uh honestly if you know us at all you probably know what episode 199 is as well uh figure it out you'll find out next week uh, don't miss Sex Drive on Fridays Beyond the Bad and the Japanese drama Woman in the Dunes on Oscar Sunday. Until then, if you want to make a movie, all you really need is a camera and a dream. Keep watching movies. Thank you.